My name is Stephen Bates of Sergis and Bates Architects, and I've been invited by the Architecture Foundation to contribute to this interesting project, which is a review of buildings and architecture in Antwerp, great dock city um, of Flanders. And I'd like to talk about the Harbour building that we recently finished. I give it a title, Big Buildings, Small Moments, which actually was the name that we gave the project at the competition stage back in 2015. The project was one of those developer architecture um, combined competitions set up by the AG Vespa, the developing arm of the city, together with the Baumeister. And we worked together with um, construction and investment partners, the developer who uh, was, is well known in the city for instance, completed recently the Falkenhoven project. And uh, the proposition was for a new urban block. And that urban block um, was at a key location within the Cardix regeneration site. As a block, it was important that the project contained a kind of coherent diversity and that was reflected in the bringing together of three different architectural practices working together with uh, the developer, Bovenbau and Bulk Architecten and ourselves, Sergius and Bates. And we worked together on the urban master plan and then allocated different buildings to design subsequently. We uh, were responsible for making the what we called the harbour building, the building that would face the main canal on the western side of the city. You can see here uh, the urban plan with the historic centre of the town to the south and this magnificent Dockland area, uh, now a really rich place of development and, and new ideas and in a way an extension of the city, both in terms of its fabric, but also perhaps in terms of its identity also. I want just to talk about a few themes, not some big complex project description. Themes that I feel, uh, well, they're close to my heart, as is the project, for reasons which I hope I can reveal to you in the next 15 minutes. But one theme is about the idea of continuity. How do you add to a city? How do you add to a great European city such as Antwerp? How do you add to a place of regeneration and a place that is transforming from a place of production to a place of living uh, as well as working. Our reaction as a team at the competition stage was to recognize the, that there was a lot of strength in the urban plan that had been provided to us and had been prepared by the city in the seeking of a heterogeneous quality and character to any of the um, development sites that had been allocated within the regeneration area. And we noticed and could feel a number of different conditions that prevailed upon the site. There was the big broad condition of the canal on the western side. There was the important representational aspect of the face of the block onto London Strat, one of the key east-west tributaries along the northern side of the centre of the city. And there was the, the sort of remnants of the Cardix uh, working site of um, narrow buildings of, of working uh, character. So there are sort of three conditions that we wanted to respond to. And we did so in allocating almost a sort of building typology uh, in response to those. And that led to the um, orientation or the, the sort of uh, assembly, you could say, of a number of buildings pushed together to form a block. We liked the way that that would represent something of a real city, a real city block, you know, not something master planned in an abstract way and built in, a, in one piece, but in fact, but something that feels like it grows in an organic way, as the city, of course, does. And we made a plaster cast model that 
indicated certain attitudes to those typologies. So this was the harbour building that had this sort of strange dichotomy of feeling a little bit like an industrial building on the one hand, but was a, in, in the end more of a residential building. So it was seeking this balance between uh, a warehouse and a mansion block. To the London Strat Street, the idea that a palazzo could face a, in an appropriate way, in a kind of very frontal way, uh, the city. And on the eastern side, the breaking up of the street face into uh, three buildings with gaps between of different scales and grains. This would give this appropriate coherent diversity uh, a heterogeneous quality that was not as uh, complex as the urban plan was suggesting and within the competition brief, but one that we felt was appropriate and deliverable. We described, as I say, this notion of big buildings, small moments, because all of us felt strongly that a good city has very clear building typologies, but it also has moments of pleasure and intimacy and small scale encounter. And we, at the very early stages, made these little intricate models that brought the viewer, in this case, the jury, into a more intimate relationship with this sort of big urban idea. And those small moments have, have stayed with us, but they really relate to a, a, a passion that I, I have about this notion of a gift that a building can offer the city, which I'll talk about shortly. We made these moments across the whole site. In terms of layout, you can see that the block is quite a long and narrow one and uh, just wide enough, we felt, to allow for a courtyard garden. And the project is built uh, around an infrastructure, a car park infrastructure of, of uh, a basement infrastructure that follows the buildings, therefore allows the center of the site to be found ground and as such is able to um, accommodate mature trees and this landscape is now um, just being put in place. So this heterogeneous urban block, um, we were very excited to have won the competition. And at that point, it was uh, agreed that we would, within the collaboration, work on this building that you see in the front of the picture, the Harbour Building. Bovenbau would work on the Palazzo to the right and Bulk Architect 10 would build the three buildings at the back. And the project was phased in two phases, the first phase being the Harbour Building and the Palazzo uh, project. The second theme I wanted to talk about was this notion of the intelligent ruin, a wonderful expression borrowed with great respect from Bob Van Riet, the first Baumeister um, of Flanders, Flemish Baumeister, and indeed a great architect from Ave Gay. And the idea that we can build for an uncertain future, that we could see buildings as infrastructures, buildings that are made of temporal layers, excites me very much because I feel it engages um, head on with ideas of sustainability and uh, uh, a reaction to the climate emergency that we all face. But what I enjoy within that statement of the intelligent ruin is this balance of pragmatism and romance that there is something poetic as well as useful and appropriate about this idea. And it, I engage with this notion of an organic, an understanding of a building as an organism um, within this theme. At the competition, we showed this image of a warehouse building within Hamburg, a building that is very dignified. It has a representational quality, despite its, in the end, infrastructural use, but it, has an it makes an appropriate face and contribution to the city. That, I think, is really, really necessary, and I have always enjoyed this idea of a a slight autonomy between the interior and its use and the facade and its role 
to it, that it plays. Of course, there's a relationship, a strong relationship, but there's also an opportunity to, uh, for each to work slightly separately. So the harbour building now complete, seen here in this picture with the with Bovenbau's uh, uh, pale blue um, palazzo building on the right hand side, reveals a complex facade, a complex facade that has built into it a number of environmental strategies that lie in a way at the heart of the whole project. Um, not only the architectural form, but the uh, technological uh, contribution the buildings make to achieve the Briam outstanding class that we advocated it should have at the competition stage. So there's a sort of industrial aspect to this building. And at the same time, the sense of repetition perhaps prompts something of the residential about it. The facade, it's given rhythm along its length by a repeated fold or bay, which is approximately five meter intervals. And the bays project over the pavement in two different dimensions. Their sequence in pairs subtly indicate the different plan types behind the facade, but they maybe more importantly give this ripple effect when seen from the ground level or seen from a distance. When you see the building from a distance, you kind of need to look twice. I, I feel the same with a project we made in Geneva, the Rue de Sondrier project, that there's something that requires you to look again and again. The more you look, the more you see. And the resulting syncopated rhythm of these subtle shifts of bay size gives a repetitive facade and a sense of sameness rather than an exactness of character. And we felt that that emphasizes the residential character, but also it makes associations with this organic character of older buildings, something I was talking about before. Those buildings that make up the city as we understand it. And those bays rest on precast concrete arches that they, in their own way, create an undulating canopy over the pavement, protecting passers-by uh, along the, the street. But as you look more carefully, not only do these projecting bays that vary um, give complexity, but so too the height of the arches that rise at the ends of the building and drop towards the center also shift your perception. And those steps don't, do, don't conform to the primary stepping of the building, uh, which you can see here in this image with a step down in the middle of the facade, allowing light into the courtyard, but also a roof terrace in the center of the plan. So the facade seems to be very straightforward and simple as it should do as a sort of unfolding ribbon, but at the detail of the hand, the, at the detail of, in a way, one's direct experience with the building, there is a lot of layers and thinking going on. You can see maybe even here an adjustment in the window proportioning between the body of the building and the upper parts of the building with the openings widening. You may also register a number of horizontal datum in which the brick, which is defined by uh, the brick bond, that also gives a sort of tripartite st structuring to the facade. We made these drawings to explain to the Baumeister our approach. You can see this AB rhythm and the, uh, the set of, let's say, tools that we laid onto the project to give this organic complexity. We made models to understand how to construct and in the most efficient of expedient way these proposals. And we employed a very large format brick, the biggest brick I've ever used. You can just about hold it in your hand. Um, that gives, it was an experiment, I guess, to see what it means to make a big building with a big brick. And underlying all of those 
ideas of composition and detail were the pragmatics of how to raise a wall of five stories um, to allow for the various um, separations for smoke and fire and expansion joints. These are built into the proportional elements um, that we introduced into the facade. This is a technical drawing. You can see it, uh, I'm on Zoom with the project architect, Kirsten Gabriels, who ran the project magnificently, um, an associate in our practice and someone who's been leading so many projects in Belgium so wonderfully. So the consequence is something that feels that it resonates with this industrial landscape and at the same time feels slightly other. And I enjoy that complexity that I think we seek in all our projects, projects which are aiming to be rooted in place, to mediate, but as I often say, mediation also means preparing for change, that there's a step change that will occur through the placing of this building in the future. It creates a new context, even though it's emerging from a very careful observation of an existing context. This is a detail that shows the way that the precast arch lands on the brick pilaster. Uh, you can see the softness of the brick with chippings that come off it. And in fact, this is a view towards um, the entrance passageway. Just a very quick view of the plan. You can see it's organized around uh, three apartments around a core, which is uh, daylit from the rear. And you can begin to sense this ripple effect of the base and the relationship on the interior to a covered porch, uh, loggia space, and the consequent little nook that's made to one side of that porch. So you can see an example of that detail. And on the upper floors, the ribbon begins to turn in and creates this sort of semi-covered outside space. Again, with these, I mean, the site is such a gift. There's such a big responsibility to build here, but also such a pleasure to be able to uh, reorientate the, the, the user of the building towards the city or towards the water and beyond to the sea. On the ground floor, this is a mix of different apartment types, by the way, on the ground floor, a rather special little studio apartment at the back of the, uh, uh, of the ground floor. The bicycle stores are tucked into the body of the building, so you don't sort of see them. We have commercial spaces on the canal, on the, on the um, dockside, and these little houses with these pointy bay windows on the back of the building. But a third theme I wanted to talk about was this idea of the transitional space, the space between things, a space that I feel I spend so much of my time thinking about, as I feel all architects should. These moments of interface between the building itself and the city, moments between the public and the private, uh, places in which I firmly believe we as architects need to protect uh, and indeed foster and grow. Uh, whenever we work on a project, I'm always keen to look for the opportunities for these transitional spaces. And in this building, we had the opportunity to make a passageway that links the quayside to the courtyard. You can see in this image that it then in fact links via one of the bulk buildings, bulk architect and buildings to the Cardix uh, regeneration area itself. This passage is uh, closed to the public, but it's very visible. And it's closed to the public because the courtyard is used only by the residents of the five buildings. Um, but I don't think that's enough to suggest that it's therefore not part of the city. And you can see that we bring together a lot of detail at this point. In other parts of the building, there's very little going on. But at this point, it's very important to bring a kind of joy and let's say a sense of luxury to, to the project, just where most people will connect and engage with it. It's a gift, a gift to the city. And we make special drawings. In this case, we used it as a way of resolving two brick facades, the red brick of the front 
and the white gray brick to the back. Uh, it resolves also various geometries and using dog tooth detailing that allows for uh, an accommodation of those geometries. And it has a beautiful ceiling of an encaustic um, cement tile that uh, makes it a place. So it's not, uh, it's not a, just a way between, it's like a room between two places. I made this image. I always have a very funny joke with the uh, with Dirk Summers about this young lady with her red bag that appears in so many competitions around the world and uh, was keen to send him this picture to remind him that you know, she gets everywhere. Um, but this was the image we made at the competition. You can see the Dina and Dina Towers in the distance and the consequent um, project as built with its Ketley floor tile pavement that runs right to the edge of the space. The doors that lead into um, bicycle stores and cores and the gate with post boxes integrated into it. At one end, you can see with this window into the communal spaces. So another place in which uh, attention to detail is placed. Another transition space where gathering and informal encounter can occur. And indeed, in this case, a direct walk through between the quayside and the private garden and to the studio houses beyond. Here you can see the courtyard side of the passage on the left hand side and these little bay windows um, inspired very much by Joseph Frank's bear house by the way uh, that make a very tiny little apartment somehow special. They have a little mezzanine at the back of the space from which this photograph is taken. They're sort of wonderful starter units you could say with protected private space to one side, you can see on the, on the right hand side, so that within the garden, there's uh, active but private sort of territory between the private and the more public territory of the courtyard. Final point I wanted to draw attention to is this idea of making together. I mean, this competition that we won was, was a pure joy to work on and we collaborate a lot on projects and I firmly believe in collaboration, not only because I think that that's how you make good cities and good architecture. The projects these days seem to get bigger and bigger, and in my opinion, need more and more uh, to involve more authors. But it was also about a coming together of people and friends, and it made the process a real pleasure. But fundamentally, making a good piece of architecture relies on a client who believes and is driven. And this project is dedicated to our client, Hans Gersens, who was direct and firm and incredibly fair and incredibly driven to make a good piece of urban architecture. He supported us through thick and thin. He made a convincing financial bid for the site in the start. You know, so many times I've been involved in well-meaning uh, projects and of high design, which never win because we'd never raise enough money. And Hans found a way of doing that. And we won the project, which inevitably was, of course, finance was very important. But he believed in the spirit of the architecture and every step in every detail was present. And his, his, um, character is in this work and I feel very sad to say that he very recently died um, and he was intending to take the top floor apartment of our building uh, which will now be occupied by his wife that he leaves and I just feel incredibly emotional about this fact because it was an absolute pleasure to work on and to become friends with, um, with Hans, as well as our other architect colleagues. And I think in passing, I would say that these, these themes remind me about who I am as an architect and, how, and the type of architecture I want to make. Fundamentally, this idea, this building is an infrastructure that's an infrastructure at the scale of the city, but when you encounter it, when you stop, 
when you examine more closely a surface or detail, you become aware of the hands of the maker, the wear and tear of the original, or indeed the inaccuracy of the very process itself. There is a mystery, there's a humor, there are multiple scales of detail, and there are mistakes, and there are moments of precision. There are residues left from the process of making it. The patina of use and weathering will give it another life. What I hope is that it projects a certain aura, a strange wholeness brought about by all those temporal layers. Thank you. At Brickworks van der Mortel, we make high quality bricks, slips and clay pavers in unique colors and sizes. With sustainability as one of our key values, we created a brand new high-end brick lab, allowing us to innovate in an eco-friendly way in the various parts of our company and the building solutions we provide. Building further on the sustainable initiatives we already had, such as maximum transport by boats reducing transport emissions, minimizing production waste and reusing it in the production process, and our ecological brick sizes, our new building runs on solar energy, parking spaces are water permeable and we planted more than 200 trees. With the Green Deal in mind, we believe in ecological and circular building solutions which meet the highest design standards of today. All this without losing our passion that we would love to share with you.